you mentioned uh, Miss Marcus, Adele Marcus, mm -hmm. her um, issue of proportion versus proportion, the freedom uh, and freedom mm -hmm. somehow balancing them. Yeah, that seems like a really interesting fundamental thing. The, yeah, because, it is. Yeah, because what we're doing is is really radical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yet, uh, it better ultimately have some spontaneity. How do you, one do you of her, say more about that? One, one of one of her points about that was um, that there should be a pulse. She never talked about beats, and she never talked about metronomic beats or, or, or anything like that. She just talked about pulse. And I, I think the, 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 the subtle but crucial difference is that a pulse is something that is organic. It's something that's human. And it's something that has a regularity about it, but is not metronomic. And, and so um, hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, a pulse is something that can quicken and can slow and uh, slow down, but in a in a uh, in an organic way. And and you know, you take a look at Schnabel's edition of the Beethoven sonatas, and there are subtle, you know, he uses metronome markings for convenience, but I mean, there are basically subtle changes in in in, the, in this you know pulse rate, if you will, all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I, I I gave a lesson a couple of days ago. Um, a girl was playing the Pathetique sonata, and she was having a very hard time choosing a tempo in the second movement because the opening she felt should be a certain tempo and the middle section she felt should be a different tempo and she was trying to come up with a compromise and she ended up being sort of vaguely miserable for the whole thing you know and and uh, and, I, and I said look you know it, it, there's this kind of fallacy that that you see one tempo marking at the beginning and that you have to stick to that in a metronomic fashion throughout a whole piece you you don't have to it, it is absolutely acceptable to finish a section and start another section and, and, and just have a feeling that it moves forward or have a feeling that it lays back a little bit. Um, but there's still a relationship, you know, I mean, and, and she was incredibly relieved to hear this. I mean, you know. You know, it makes me, I heard a recording of Bachhaus and, mm -hmm. you know, and the Pathetique, mm -hmm. and he plays it terrifically fast, but then when he gets to, you know. Mm. Oh, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It takes it noticeably slower, and uh -huh. it is hard to... Oh, sure, yeah, it's very it's awkward, yeah. It's the, it's the movement, it's not yes. once you're there. No, 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 it's some, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe, so maybe... Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, and, and of course, that's another thing where, again, being a pianist, there are so many disadvantages inherent in, 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 in the instrument. I, on any other instrument, especially including the human voice, if, if you do a melodic leap from here to here, a tenth higher... Mm -hmm. There, there's, there's an effort to get to that note. Ah, yeah, you know, you, you can't just do it, you know. Uh, but on the piano, you can do it, you know, and, and without any effort at all. And 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 so you have to really train yourself to have a sensitivity to these things because because it's not natural to do bum bum, you know, in a melodic situation, it's just it's ridiculous. And 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 you really have to train yourself to hear to hear that so that so that you're playing you know in a, in a, in a you're doing you're doing something that that is that, that that is related to to singing you know i mean and that's the other thing i mean teachers are always talking about singing at the piano well how do you do that i mean it, it's it, it's it's many many things and the, the the most irritating thing which which was wonderfully instructive that Adel Marcus used to do was um, take a pencil and say, you know, there's more musicianship in this pencil than you've got in your right hand today. And then, I don't think I have a pencil with me, but uh, that, let's see, that's not going to work. The reason she used a pencil was because it had an eraser tip. But uh, but basically, she would do something like, you know, uh, because of the eraser, but I mean, she'd play it so beautifully, and you'd be in tears how beautiful it was, and, yeah, yeah. you know, and she'd be using a, you know, a pencil, um, and, and <laughs> you know, but, but, but it, it, sometimes playing the piano is just simply too easy, you know, sometimes playing a melody is just too easy, uh, and for a pianist to play, and, 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 and the real artistry is, is making it, 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 a, a, you know, an experience instead of just, just playing notes, you know, <laughs> and it's not easy to, to learn to do that. You know, you talk about how in the time of Chopin, the, the knowledge of the, the Polonaise with the dance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. orchestra that he wrote in would have been assumed it was mm -hmm. in the air in mm -hmm. the yeah, yeah. atmosphere. And, and, and it is less so in mm -hmm. the mainstream America. Mm -hmm. Isn't it becoming an issue to, to, uh, 
sort of convey and teach this aspect of playing, not so much the analytical, mm -hmm. theoretical mm -hmm. aspect, but the mood, uh, the world in which these composers yeah, the, the world, The world is important, and... and, and I don't know if they're reading literature or... Yeah, but also... I mean, with the Del Marcus, you have a lineage mm -hmm. that's that way. Uh, ab absolutely. And I, I think m many of those things are things which are passed down as traditional values and traditional types of understanding. I think it's valuable to be aware of these things. I also think you can get too worried about it. But I, for the longest time, wasn't comfortable playing polonaises and Hungarian rhapsodies and things. I felt like there's a national, there's, there's a nationalistic rhythmic requirement that I don't quite get yet. And mm -hmm. and and Merrick in, in Banff was. I remember I studied mazurkas with him because even Rosina Levine would say, "Well, let's leave the mazurkas to Merrick when he was studying at Juilliard because he he, he uh, Jablonski, yeah, oh. uh, yeah, because he, he's Polish and he understood. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it was just part of him and and and. I can't remember all the details now, but he, he actually was able to sort of mathematically on a blackboard show us the difference between a mazurka and a waltz, you know, and and, uh, and, and exactly what the implications are, and including you know the harmonies and how they move and, and what they what they represent. But it's it, any one of us can learn can learn how to do that and, and and learn how to. I mean, first you have to learn it, and then you have to forget what you've learned and just be natural again, you know. So it's like a two step process. Um, but it, it, it's kind of satisfying to think that uh, if we're having difficulties playing playing mazurkas and polonaises with the right kind of flavor, I've heard, I've heard some comp very, very funny mishaps with Europeans trying to play Gershwin, for example, you know, and, 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 and you know, we have our own um, stylistic things that we are familiar with, actually, and, and that others aren't. Um, even playing um, uh, the, the uh, recently the Barber Piano Concerto, there's there's an element of rock and roll in the last movement that it, that is uh, totally American. I mean, even though it's in five, but does you know, I mean that's that's an American writing. I mean it, it's not European, you know, and um, and that's a very exciting thing that that that, that we have. Urban, it's very yeah, urban, absolutely, yeah, yeah, um, and. Uh, it's it, it has a bite to it. I remember once um, uh, uh, this was very interesting. Um, working with Andre Previn in London, and he had just been in Vienna, mm -hmm. and he had conducted one of the Vienna orchestras. And there had been some Bernstein on the program. I think on the waterfront, maybe, and uh, or on or on the uh, on the town, and um, uh, something else. But but he he was he he was he this is an orchestra he's worked with for many many years. And he came to London, and he was in a state of total frustration about it. And I. I so what happened? And, and he said, well, they can't play short notes in Vienna. They just can't do it. It, it is so against their instinct to play a short note that, uh, you know, they, uh, the real urban sound of America, as you put it, of American music sometimes involves very Kind of, kind of, mm -hmm. kind of note values, mm -hmm. and and these guys are raised on Schubert, where 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 notes are are long and and graceful, and you would never play a short short note. It's, it's just mm -hmm. a, a, anti musical to them. So, so it's you know there are certain things. I I actually kind of think that's a it's a good thing. I, it, it's the, the world's become too homogenous already, and I, if 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 there are certain parts of the world where certain styles of music are understood better than others, that's fine with me. I you know <laughs> you did a recording of the barber. Concerto and the sonata, and no, 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 just just the concerto. It, it, but, um, but you play I've played the sonata a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the 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 I meant to bring one to give you, and I don't think I remember to put one in my bag. Are, is someone going to give you one of those, or are you going to get a hold of one? What the, the barber concerto recording? I love it. Yeah. No, no, nobody's done. Well, uh, we should try to arrange that. Um, if you call, you could even call when you talk to the ISM publicity people and. Tell them that I said that they should send you one because uh, they've got them. And, and if they need to clear it with me first, then they'll just call me first. But I mean, I'd love you to have it. Uh, the violin concerto and the souvenirs are also on that, on that recording. Oh, the barber souvenirs, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the orchestral souvenirs, yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful recording, just having a variety of things on it. Did you hear that? There's an old reissue of Horowitz playing some of those. They take. Really? Vladimir Horowitz. No kidding. I'll send you the tape. Oh, that would be interesting to hear. Yeah, I, I that, that's in the forties. He played some of huh? Carnegie Hall. And wow! Wait, in, the, in a two, a two hand. I mean, no, I thought they were arranged. It's the because I know they were arranged for four hands. What are the titles of those? Like, uh, oh, well, they've got fun, a, funny titles. And I West, is there a Western theme to one of them? Uh, yeah, there's some different things. Yeah, I'll, I'll look, I'll they're they're quirky. They're, they're quirky, fun pieces. Yeah, but I know there's a four hand arrangement which I've never played. But um, 
I didn't know about a solo. Maybe he did it himself. I mean, it's not out of the question. Yeah. So back to the proportion and freedom question. Mm -hmm. How how do you arrive at a sense of, of taste? I guess I assume from her thinking that if everything were absolutely perfectly proportionate but not free, we'd have a very cold kind of structured thing that wasn't right. expressive of everything were <laughs> too free without it's structure, we'd have... Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's uh, amorphous, yeah, yeah you, lo you lose the whole deal. Perfume. Yeah, yeah, it... it, it How do you... It must be a it, feeling. It's a feeling because it's a stylistic issue with different composers and it's a specific issue with different pieces. But it's there's just a very different way of approaching it in Chopin than, than there is in, in Mozart. But it's 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 an issue in both cases. And Mozart can be very dull if it's metronomic. And, and Beethoven, a Beethoven slow movement um, can be death unless you really understand the structure. I mean, and you have to understand the structure and, 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 and how... Um, how how it's the big picture of, of not just each bar but each group of eight bars and sixteen and thirty two bars and how they how they relate and you need to know that before you can play and then the proportion of it starts to to fall into place and you and you start already to feel an inst uh, an instinct of, of your own as to where where you can um, you can let up and, and, and where you can move uh, another another issue about uh, about freedom in playing is that uh, a lot of musicians when they want to be expressive in a temporal way, make some kind of a retard and or slow down. And uh, it doesn't seem to be as obvious to do the opposite and to move forward. And so I hear, I hear a lot of music being played by very sensitive musicians who are slowing down here and taking time there and slowing down here. And then it starts to fall apart because, because there hasn't been any reverse polar thing, you know, yeah, to compensate for it and, 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 and have it move. So that that's that, that helps that helps a lot too. Because again that's 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 something something with the pulse that it, it you, you you can actually have a very regular pulse and then within those big beats be doing some very interesting things which include pulling back and moving forward. And and it, I think in the variations this morning I felt that the um, the issue that you were trying to work <laughs> with was really very the very demanding task of Dealing with the relationship of one variation to what's coming next, mm -hmm. and its its existence with relation to the other variation, mm -hmm. but also what's going yes, on. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. So there are different levels. Right? There are many different levels. I, I, actually, the the the, the Brahms Handel variations in particular, the the, the, the Brahms Paganini variations um, also have a sense of of, of building up. Um, but in a in a in a different way. I think in the case of the Brahms Handel, it it becomes just this absolutely profound. A crescendo of activity and, 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 and everything. And the Paganini variations are more difficult in the sense that many of those variations, every bar is the same rhythmic pattern. In, you know, and, and, and you have it repeated eight times, and then you have it, and then another eight times, and then you're into the next variation, and it's just so easy to, to have it either come off as metronomic or to always, you know, take, always do a retard at every second bar or every fourth bar, and, and it, it, it just can fall into those kinds of traps very easily, and, and to get out of that so that there's a, a, a sense of a longer line, and, and it's, it's very tough, I and mean, it, it's, that doesn't come easily, and, uh, and in the Handel variations, kind of like the Rachmaninoff Paganini variations, there, there's a sense of big groupings of variations, and mm -hmm. and then an overall kind of buildup of, of activity, you know. And you have to achieve all of that at the same time as, as all the detailed things that you're doing along okay. the way. Some pieces, I suppose, easier to grasp for maybe younger people, or beginning, maybe a little bit less complex in that way. But oh, there are, there are no easy pieces, but well, yes, no, but I mean, certainly there are some. I mean. Uh, um, a lot of character pieces are, which includes short pieces of Schumann, and it includes uh, short pieces of Bartok and 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 um, Hinastera and, and any number of others. But there are a lot of shorter pieces in which, like a novelist writing a short story, you can explore some very specific musical issue and not have to worry too much about structure. And and and, and some composers, like Schumann, for example, were clearly more comfortable working with with with, with character pieces than big structures. I mean, I, I think. Schumann's sonatas suffer a little bit, and his symphonies also, from from being a little bit repetitive and really kind of actually square. I mean, I mean Schumann, who on the one hand was so personal in what he wrote for for solo piano and what he wrote for for voice, mm. 
his chamber music and his symphonies are remarkably square in their construction. You know, they're just big, you know, always eight bar chunks that, that cadence and start and cadence and start in the same place. And, and it's, it's more challenging than it should be sometimes to make that work. I mean, if you can achieve that kind of flow, Mm-hmm. That is what you'd call Schumann-esque. You know, you, you achieve that flow, then then it's fine. But it, it's it's not always easy to get that. Uh, you know, that's so that's always kind of an interesting thing. I remember when I um, when I was working with Lee Kum Singh in Vancouver. That was the first time that I I understood how to work in detail. I mean, I I, I took Beethoven Opus 10, first movement to him, and I remember we spent several lessons just on the first couple of pages and I, I it never occurred to me that you could get, be that detailed before about you know, mm-hmm. the, you know I just hadn't thought I was, I was very instinctive Which opus 10 was uh, oh, no opus 110 the one that we were, the, the, the one that Ian played a little bit of today I, I mean I I, um, I didn't understand how 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 much there was I was a very instinctive pianist up until that point which was a good thing for me to be but it, you know at that point I suddenly needed to get very serious about detail and 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 um, and Kum Singh was wonderful with that. I mean, he just and he showed me touch, and he he had this very sophisticated way of pedaling that I had never really thought about, and just you know many many things. And then, sort of simultaneously, during the time I studied with him and and studying with Adele Marcus, I, I went to Banff and studied with with uh, Jablonski. And and Merrick always stressed uh, expression and line. I mean, he he really was the first person to teach me about how to phrase a line and how to make a line sing and make a line have a direction and 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 a big overall shape and, and all that and uh, and then by the time I got to New York to study with Adele I mean she put it all together you know she just put it all together and, and sort of fine fine-tuned everything um, Ian's father Edward is really is an astonishing teacher I mean he's the the, the, the best teacher of uh, uh, for young people that I know I mean he somehow was able to always get you know he, he understands that discipline comes first before too much freedom, you know, and, and how important that was. And then my other principal teacher was my mother, who basically sat with me every day when I practiced. And, mm. How helpful and, and, that must be. Oh, oh, in, infinitely. I mean, it really, uh, it was definitely a family affair when I was a kid. You know, I'd have these you know, weekly lessons with Edward. But my mom, basically, every day that I was practicing, she'd be either sitting and listening or nearby and listening and just kind of monitoring that I was following whatever I'd been taught in the last lesson. Yeah. That's the point where a lot of kids freeze up, isn't it? I mean, they're so... Yeah. I mean, that's the, the risk. That well, the difficulty is you, you go through stages. Um, something that Mr. Lee wanted very much to do was he did not want me to have to perform for a couple of years. And hmm. I was so into performing when I was a kid. I mean, I performed dozens of times a year in small little music festivals and other things, and I was just always on stage playing, and I loved it. And and I think he wanted to, to muddy the waters and confuse me for a while, and he wanted to feel free to... To, to take my technique apart a little bit and 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 he knew that if he went into that much detail that I was going to be kind of messed up for a while on 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 absorbing all of that and he didn't want me to have to perform for a while because my parents didn't really understand that and they they didn't want me to stop performing and competing and all that but you know he he went out for a little while anyway and um and, and of course it was extremely valuable for me to be able to experiment mm-hmm. and have the freedom to experiment and and change some of my technique and change some of my approach and not have to suddenly rehearse something for a concert, but just mm-hmm. just forget about that for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and every every musician should go through that. I, I there are certain I think there are certain things that all musicians should go through. I, I I think somewhere along the way you need to go through a period where where you're not performing for long enough that you can experiment. But I I, I also think I I was a natural talent when I was young. I, I played with with a lot of ease and it, and I always felt comfortable. I was able to get away with practicing less than most of my people who were the same age. But around about the time I was 21, 20 or 21, I was at Juilliard, and I thought, I need to really, really work, you know, and I, I and I could kind of see that I needed to really work, and for about three years, that's all I did, I mean, I really worked, I mean, and I, I enjoyed myself, and I had a good time, and enjoyed New York, and, and, and all that, but, but I was basically focused on practicing like more, more than, well, I mean, you know, I, I, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I'd have plenty of those, you know, where I would really just be, um, uh, for the first few years I was in New York, I, I didn't have a piano, I just practiced at Juilliard, and I'd just be kind of holed away in a practice room, you know, for hours and hours, and, and I mean, I had and I had perspective, because, I mean, Juilliard used to be closed on Sundays, and then closed relatively early at night at 10 o'clock, I think, and, and, and I would, you know, get out and experience nightlife, and go to, I went to the Met Museum every Sunday for about two years, I mean, I was just addicted to the place, and, and jazz clubs and things, and just anything I could do to get 
out of the you know the, the tunnel thing, but but still a few years there where I really worked, and I mean I, I think you go and you go in spurts like that that you just really really work, you know, and then and and then when you're all done with it, you suddenly realize that you really have made tremendous progress. My father remembers my saying to him when I was about twenty or twenty one, very frustrated sort of. I said to him, look, my technique is not going to get any better. This is where it's at. It's good. You know, it's not. Fabulous, but it's good, and I, I just can't see that it's going to get better. And I really felt like I just hit a wall, you know. And uh, and then I started working, and it got a lot better. Yeah. So. Yeah. Were you working intensively on a smaller repertoire, or were you building? Uh, a little bit of both. The first year that I was at Juilliard, I spent the whole year obsessed with the Schumann Fantasy. <laughs> that was the first big piece was I studied. That okay with the Del Mar. Well, yeah, no, it, it was mostly because of her. It was the first big piece that I studied with her, and I was so it just in, in having revelation after revelation about about music through that piece. Mm. And I got I was so obsessed with it that year that, that by the end of the year I had barely prepared enough other repertoire to put together a jury to play, you know, for the you know to, to get to, to pass through the year. But I, I just and it was good. It was good to obsess that much about one piece and and really, you know, mm -hmm. try to. You know, try to put everything you've learned into one piece and 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 make it work. And then after that, I really started just chewing up repertoire like crazy. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I did because you know, the, the the earlier you do it, the better. I mean, stuff that you learn from from your late teens and and early twenties generally stays with. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. It just sticks. And other things, you know, I only finally learned, you know, the famous Rack Three uh, a couple of years ago. I played the first movement of Rack Three when I was 17 mm -hmm. with a student orchestra, and when I was about 19, just around about the time I went to New York, um, I tried to relearn it for a competition, and it was too hard for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I played it fine when I was 17, but mm -hmm. two years later I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I had grown up, you know, and I, I had suddenly realized how hard it was, and, and, and I, was, yeah. I was intimidated by it, and I tried to relearn it, and I just couldn't, it, it really it freaked me out. And then repeatedly tried to learn the rest of the concerto, and it was just, it was just like this mountain I couldn't climb, you know. And, and uh, finally, about four years ago, I, I, I committed myself to several performances of it, and I just, you know, did a real woodshedding thing in New York. I just shut everything out for a while, and I finally learned it, and I felt so good playing it. Oh, God. Such a monstrous piece. But because I waited so long, um, I now haven't played it in two years, and, and I picked up the music the other day and looked at it, and it just looked like, you know, like, like, foreign territory all over again, you know, it's horrible. <laughs> it's going to be almost as much work to do it again. But it sounds like a good idea to, to really go into one piece, you know, that you're attracted to and really mm -hmm. give it the business. You kind of, yeah. You know. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very, very helpful, very instructive, very interesting experience. Even though you're not going to have either the time or or maybe even the need to do it with everything. No, 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 absolutely not. But 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 you'll learn a lot of very special things by doing that. That first movement of the fantasy is so rich. Oh yeah, and it, but it's very difficult to hold together. It's very very difficult. It's 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 immensely challenging. It's so easy to do the wrong thing and 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 to distort it in in a way that isn't you know that isn't musical. Or say it's very very hard. Yeah. That's the piece that I. Um, that's the piece that I ended up relearning to to play for for Adele's memorial concert, and, and I, I had not played it in about 14 years or something, and it was a magical experience to come back to it. I mean, it really put me right back to being 19 and, and stressing out over every note, you know. Did she have assistant teachers? No, no, far from it. I, she she went overtime all the time. <laughs> so, oh yeah, and. and um, also, she, uh, uh, you know, the one hour a week thing is sometimes good, sometimes not so good. She wouldn't hesitate to call me up and say, you know, do you mind skipping the next couple of weeks? And I said no, and uh, and then I'd have something important, and suddenly she'd give me a four-hour lesson two days in a row or something. You know, I mean, so she really she she focused on her students at the times that they needed it the most, and and, and I certainly was fortunate to have. A very constructive relationship with her, because um, she could be very tough on her students, and she was tough on me, but always in a supportive way. And um, I, 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 just, I was—I just remember being always amazed at, at lessons with her, because I, I, I believed in everything that she said, and I was just constantly surprised. I'd play something for her, and I'd expect her to say something, and then I'd always hear something different. You know, I could never second guess what was going to what was going to happen. You know, it was interesting. Yeah, it was always surprising. You know, one very positive impression I have talking to mm -hmm. people secondhand is she has had a sense of who the student was and what what they were good at and how they oh, yeah. their, their strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually than imposing Yeah, yes, absolutely. Something actually we all appreciated is that we all sounded different. 
and even after several years of studying with her, we still all sounded different. And we were really encouraged to, 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 to go into enough analysis, to, uh, self-analysis, to, to pull out you know, what was unique to each of us. And uh, I, I, I was really impressed with the fact that she didn't, I mean, she, she and a few other teachers at Juilliard were in a position that they could kind of have their pick of the, of the students who were auditioning. And, and, and she was a, a powerful member of the faculty, and she, she certainly had that option, I think. And um, she didn't always pick the ones with the best finger technique. I mean, she she had a few students who were who were maybe not so phenomenally gifted in a physical way or technical way, but were musically somehow very interesting people, pretty interesting personalities, you know. And she enjoyed in teaching them as much as a, as anyone. And 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 maybe she would talk about some technical issues also. Uh, which we didn't talk about that much, but um, but that, I mean technique for her she defined differently. I mean, when most people talk about technique, they're talking about the mechanics of playing, and mm -hmm. and for her for her the word technique it was all encompassing. I mean, you know, um, how to how to make a beautiful phrase is part of your technique. You know, I mean that was her use of the word was is just different semantics. But but um, yeah, she was she'd be she would be fascinated with an individual personality and, mm -hmm. and want to work with it. And she's had quite a stable. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. An extraordinary accomplishment. Yeah. I'm going to interview Byron Janice next month. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it's a package. You're a package deal. Uh. <laughs> Since you have the same, I don't know about management. I don't know if he has managers, but the publicists, uh, they handle him also. Oh, do they? Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. He was on the Today Show a few weeks ago. <coughs> I didn't. What was I he? To oh. I think probably talking about arthritis and mm -hmm. you know. Uh, he's he's gone through so much. I I have um, uh, his recording, and well, I'll tell you, I've mentioned this recording to a few people, and and, and they had the same experience I did. But his recording. Let me guess, Rachmaninoff first. <laughs> and the Prokofiev third yeah. with Kondrashin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I obsessed with that recording when I was a teenager. I mean, I listened to the the Prokofiev in particular, but both of them, but Prokofiev. I mean, I just remember I listened to it so many times that the record is completely scratched up and beat mm -hmm. to hell, and you can't you can you know just skips all the time now. But I. Oh, so many times, yeah. It was an incredible record. I heard him here, oh, it has to be at least 20 years ago, mm -hmm. I think more than that. Mm -hmm. He played, is the, was one of the Sasan concertos called The Egyptian? Yes, I, I, it's the fourth or fifth or something, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he played that, mm -hmm. and I could see something mm -hmm. wasn't quite, yeah, yeah. something wasn't yeah. quite right, and then that was... Mm -hmm. He, he, he was really was really great having him around for the for Adele's concert. I mean, we were all so incredibly grateful to him that he he would play at all. Yeah. Uh, just sort of an interesting aside, we, we we needed two pianos because there were a couple of two piano performances on the program.